Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. The CEO of the ARRL, Tom Gallagher, NY2RF, announces his retirement. The ARRL Board of Directors meets as we go to air this week. The FCC announces contingency plans should the government shutdown happen this weekend. The Department of Defense's interoperability communications exercise is deemed a success. Ofcom in the UK prepares to auction Spectrum in the 2.3 and 2.4 gigahertz bands. Congress wants a full investigation into the fake missile EAS alert in Hawaii. A whisper beacon takes to the air in Antarctica. And the creator and executive producer of WKRP in Cincinnati makes the news. We'll have the story in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites orbiting the planet. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here to talk about the meltdown and specter processor vulnerability, the false alert in Hawaii, and tips on file recovery. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, will be here to suggest how we can build a better community. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with another edition of his Amateur Radio History Headlines. And we will flash back to a special talk given by Dick Helton, W9CTY, former news anchor on WBBM News Radio in Chicago, about how he got into amateur radio. All this and more is straight ahead as edition number 986 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from Studio 2 in our worldwide headquarters here in Albany, New York, where all the hams are hitting the slopes, I'm W2XBS. Reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, from the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from the frozen tundra of the western Catskills of New York, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And coming to you from Studio 1 in our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox, 2 Fox. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. A late-breaking story leads this week's newscast. As we go into production this week, it was announced that ARRL's chief executive officer for the past two years, Tom Gallagher, NY2RF, announced his retirement as CEO. As the ARRL board of directors prepares to meet January 19th and 20th, he will step down on March 2nd. Here with more details, reporting from League Headquarters is Steve Ford, WB8IMY. ARRL's Chief Executive Officer for the last two years, Tom Gallagher, NY2RF, announced his retirement as CEO as the ARRL Board of Directors prepared to meet January 19th through 20th. He will step down on March 2nd. Gallagher, who had earlier advised ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, of his intention to resign, expressed his gratitude to Roderick and the ARRL board for giving him the opportunity to help guide the organization. Gallagher, 69, cited recent changes included in the new federal tax law that made it unattractive for him to continue working in Connecticut, where ARRL is headquartered. Among Gallagher's chief accomplishments during his tenure as CEO were creating an enhanced level of professionalism and efficiency in the organization that represents more than 150,000 U.S. amateur radio operators. Gallagher also oversaw a significant turnaround in the organization's financial performance. It has been my great privilege to serve in this capacity for two years, and I am deeply grateful to the board and President Rick Roderick, K5UR, for their support and encouragement, Gallagher said. President Roderick expressed appreciation for Gallagher's contributions to the ARRL. The ARRL is in a transition to a new generation for amateur radio. Change doesn't come easy, Roderick said. Tom helped us in taking that step forward, and for that, we are very grateful for his service to the league and to amateur radio, he said. The board will evaluate and determine the next steps to take in a search for his replacement when it meets this week. Licensed in Pennsylvania in 1966 as WA3GRF, 
Later, N4GRF in North Carolina, Gallagher is a member of the West Palm Beach Amateur Radio Group. He has described himself as an incurable HFDXer and consummate tinkerer and credits his first visit to the Franklin Institute's amateur radio station, W3TKQ, in 1963 for inspiring his interest in ham radio. Amateur radio led to an early career in broadcasting. He was a cameraman and technician at WGBH-TV in Boston, the CBS television network, and Metro Media's WIP Radio in Philadelphia. Gallagher joined ARRL following three decades as an international investment banker and financial services executive. His career has included senior leadership positions with J.P. Morgan Chase & Company and CIBC Oppenheimer & Company in New York and with Wachovia Capital Markets in Charlotte, North Carolina. He has also served as an adjunct professor at the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and is CEO of the Secondary School Admission Test Board in Princeton, New Jersey. He has served on boards both public and nonprofit, including two NYSE companies, the NPR affiliate in Charlotte, North Carolina, the executive board of the Penn Fund at the University of Pennsylvania, and the International Center of Photography. The FCC has issued a brief statement regarding its plans in the event of a partial government shutdown, which could start on January 20th. At press time, according to C-SPAN, there was no Senate vote scheduled on the House passed legislation to keep the government open a few more weeks. Asked what the FCC would do in case of a shutdown, Brian Hart, director of the FCC's Office of Media Relations, said that in the event of a partial government shutdown because of available funding, the Federal Communication Commission's plans to remain open and pay staff at least through the close of business Friday, January 26. During the October 2013 three-week shutdown, the FCC shuttered its website and had to suspend filing deadlines and suspend its merger review shot clocks. Commissioners and some essential personnel still came to work, however, this means the FCC will continue to accept and process amateur radio license applications and grants for at least another week. During the 16-day 2013 shutdown, the FCC retained eight employees to conduct interference detection, mitigation, and disaster response operations. Only one senior management official was left in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, which oversaw amateur radio at that point in time. The ARRL Board of Directors will hold its 2018 annual meeting January 19th and 20th in Windsor, Connecticut. The first order of business will be the election of officers. The board will elect candidates to the volunteer posts of ARRL President, First and Second Vice President, and the International Affairs Vice President, as well as to the offices of Secretary, Treasurer, Chief Executive Officer, and Chief Financial Officer. CEO Tom Gallagher, NY2RF, has announced that he will retire on March 2nd. The board will evaluate and determine the next steps to take in a search for his replacement when it meets this week. The board also will receive and or hear and perhaps later consider recommendations from a wide range of reports from officers, the general counsel, and committees and coordinators, including entry-level license committee, the official observers program study committee, and the legislative advocacy committee. The board will also hear and consider proposals to amend the ARRL Articles of Association and bylaws. It will consider the application by SKNAARS to become the IARU Member Society for St. Kitts and Nevis. We'll have a complete coverage of the ARRL Board of Directors meeting next week. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. A November 2017 Department of Defense-sponsored communications interoperability exercise involving amateur radio was a success, according to information received recently from U.S. Army Military Auxiliary Radio System Program Manager Paul English, WD8DBY. Here with more details, reporting from League Headquarters, is Steve Ford, WB8IMY. The November drill focused on interoperability between the Department of Defense elements, including Mars, other federal agencies, and the amateur radio community. The scenario involved a massive coronal mass ejection event that impacted the national power grid as well as all forms of traditional communication, including landline telephone, cell phone, satellite, and internet connectivity. Army and Air Force Mars organizations worked in conjunction with the amateur radio community, primarily on the 60-meter interoperability channels, as well as on HF and VIS frequencies and local VHF and UHF repeaters. 
The amateur radio portion of the exercise kicked off with a high-power information broadcast on 60-meter channel 1, which is 5.330.5 megahertz, from a military station on the East Coast and the Fort Huacha HF Gateway Station in Arizona. The high-power broadcast provided basic exercise information and requested that amateur stations make contact with Mars stations on 60 meters and provide county-by-county -county status reports in order to maintain situational awareness and to determine the extent of the impact. Radio amateurs were also given the opportunity to submit reception reports and receive QSL cards. New for this exercise, planners divided the continental U.S. geographically and assigned each region to one 60-meter channel in order to make more efficient use of all five channels. Planners roughly divided the U.S. into northeast, southeast, northwest, southwest, and central regions. Also for this exercise, military planners incorporated a daytime informational broadcast on 13.483.5 MHz. The purpose of that broadcast was to extend the exercise outreach to the amateur community and also to provide exercise updates. English said that 733 broadcast reception reports were received. 494 of those, or 67 percent, were from the 60-meter broadcast, while the remaining 244 reports were for the 13 megahertz broadcast. Amateur radio support for these DOD interoperability exercises continues to grow, English said. The 60-meter broadcasts were received by stations in Canada, Spain, and Switzerland, and reception reports came from several members of the shortwave listening community. Nearly 2,000 amateur radio stations took part in the exercise, submitting 3,025 county status reports, nearly 1,300 of them unique. QSL cards for amateurs and shortwave listeners who participated in this exercise are being processed and will be mailed in January. Leaders from the supported DOD headquarters, as well as the chiefs of both the Army and Air Force Mars programs, appreciated the nearly 2,000 amateur radio stations that trained during this exercise, English said. Ofcom, the British equivalent of the FCC, has published an update in the timetable for setting the regulations that will apply to the forthcoming auction of Spectrum in 2.3 and 3.4 gigahertz bands in the UK. Ofcom believes it is of the public interest for the auction to take place as soon as possible in the light of the significant and strong demand for access to the spectrum and the immediate and direct benefits to consumers of faster, higher quality mobile data services that can be offered using that spectrum. Part of the spectrum to be auctioned, the 2.3 gigahertz band, can be used by mobile companies immediately to improve services for customers. The 3.4 gigahertz spectrum band can be used for future 5G mobile services. Ofcom had planned to hold the auction in autumn of 2017, but had been delayed by litigation brought by 3 and by the BT-EE following an expedited court process recognizing the strong public interest in proceeding with the auction. The High Court upheld Ofcom's decision and dismissed both claims on 20 December. However, 3 has now sought permission to appeal on the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals is also expediting that appeal, which will be heard on the 13th and 14th of February 2018. The litigation by 3 is continuing to delay access to the spectrum and benefits to consumers and businesses that can flow from it. We are keen to ensure that we can move as quickly as possible to hold the auction once the judgment of the Court of Appeals has been given. Once the judgment of the court is known, applicants will be in accordance with the regulations and have a period to indicate to Ofcom whether they wish to withdraw from the award process and be refunded their initial deposit prior to the last day for withdrawal. Registration is now open for the two-day HAMSI, the Amateur Radio Citizen Science Initiative Workshop, February 23rd and 24th at the New Jersey Institute of Technology in Newark. The 2018 HAMSI Workshop will be held at the NJIT Campus Center Ballroom. Complimentary parking is available at NJIT Parking Deck, 154 Summit Street, Newark. The 2018 HAMSI Workshop will focus on the results of the 2017 Great American Eclipse and the development of a personal space weather station, said Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, Assistant Research Professor at NJIT Center for Solar Terrestrial Research. We are especially looking for speakers with presentations showing analysis of 2017 Great American Eclipse Ionospheric Observations, Ideas and Proposal for the Design and Implementation of a Personal Space Weather Station. We will also accept other presentations related to amateur radio and science. 
Frizzell expects that the presentations will run between 20 and 30 minutes. Contact Frizzell if you would like to present and provide an abstract by February 15th. Presentations should be on any topic about how the ionosphere and or radio propagation was affected by the eclipse. Frizzell said that all hams and scientists interested in ham radio science are welcome. The aim of the workshop is to foster collaborations between ham radio, space, science, and space weather research communities through presentations, discussions, and demonstrations. This year's meeting will focus on solar eclipse analysis, ham radio data sources and databases, and the development of a personal space weather station. The schedule calls for oral presentations on ham radio data sources, databases analysis, and solar eclipse effects on the ionosphere, including results from the Solar Eclipse QSO party. Phil Erickson, W1PJE, of MIT's Haystack Observatory, is scheduled to be the Friday evening banquet speaker. Tutorials on Saturday will include Ham Radio for Space Scientists, Space Science for Ham Radio Operators with Frank Donovan, W3LPL. Friday registration is $100, which includes a breakfast, lunch, and a banquet ticket. Saturday registration is $25, which includes breakfast and lunch. Friday banquet tickets are $50. The Ham Radio Data Sources and Database session addresses an ongoing ham side topic, Frizzell told the ARRL. We will have presentations and discussions about the current methods that we use to collect data in ham radio and how it is stored, and how we can make it more scientifically useful in current analyses making use of these data sets. Frizzell said a huge amount of data is already available from such sources at the Reverse Beacon Network, PSK Reporter, WSPR Net. However, this data is really designed for amateur radio use, and new techniques need to be developed to make it useful scientifically, he added. Frizzell said HamSci would like to encourage development of the personal space station. This is analogous to a personal weather station that people install at their homes to measure temperature, wind speed, rainfall, humidity, etc. Reporting this data to groups like NWS, NOAA, and the Weather Underground, Frizzell said. We want to create a similar package for space weather and have that data go to a single repository. Frizzell said he hopes HAMS attending will come away more knowledgeable about ionospheric and space science, and scientists will gain a better understanding of amateur radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. The Federal Communications Commission is continuing its investigation into last weekend's false alert that warned Hawaiians of an impending missile strike. Based on the information collected so far, it appears that the incident was caused both by human error and by the state of Hawaii not having reasonable safeguards in place to prevent that human error from leading to the transmission of a false alert, FCC Chair Ajit Pai said on Wednesday. It also took Hawaii's emergency management agency 38 minutes to send a correction. The delay appears to be the result of the state mistakenly believing it needed FEMA's permission to send a correction. That's something FEMA hasn't required since changing its rules in 2012. No deaths were the result of the panic that was caused, but local press reports say one man suffered a massive heart attack after saying his goodbyes to his family. In a previously scheduled address to the NG911 Institute in Washington, Pai called the false alert unacceptable and avoidable, adding that it served as a critical lesson for emergency communication systems of all kinds. They shouldn't be designed so that a single point of failure leads to a catastrophic result. Nothing and no one is perfect, he said. Our emergency communication systems need to be designed to take account of these realities by having appropriate safeguards and redundancies. In the wake of Saturday's false ballistic missile alarms, Representative Colleen Hanabuza and Tulsi Gabbard have requested the House Armed Services Committee launch its own congressional investigation. Gabbard said the colossal failure that led to the false missile alert being sent revealed a chain of failures that should serve as a wake-up call in Washington for what needs to be immediately corrected. We must get to the bottom of what occurred hold those responsible accountable, and take necessary steps to ensure this never happens again in Hawaii or anywhere in the country, Gabbard said. Hanabusa said Congress should work with not only the Pentagon, but also with the FCC and state agencies as it digs deeper into EAS. She said such a review would present an opportunity to learn from the mistake to make sure emergency management processes and policies are sound, rigorous, and tested. The two House members are also questioning whether U.S. Pacific Command, which oversees all military forces in the Asia-Pacific region, including Hawaii, should continue to have the authority and capability to unilaterally broadcast emergency alert messages. Concerns over EAS have resulted in a rare moment of bipartisanship on Capitol Hill, where members on both sides of the aisle want to hear what the FCC finds in its investigation and how a similar error can be avoided elsewhere. The House Energy and Commerce Committee said it plans to hold a hearing with the FCC commissioners at the witness table in the coming weeks. 
Meanwhile, Hawaii Governor David Ige this week appointed Brigadier General Kenneth Hera to oversee the comprehensive review of the state's emergency management operations. Ike also said that several changes have already been put into effect, including a two-step, two-person rule for all radio, TV, and wireless activations. Produced by amateurs for amateurs and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm speaking with Joe Karsha, NJ1Q. He's the station manager of W1AW, the amateur radio station across the parking lot here at ARRL headquarters in Newington, Connecticut. And Joe, can you give listeners just a rough idea of what the heck you do over there? (laughs) It all depends on who you ask. At W1AW, Our first and foremost mission is the transmission of code practice and bulletins. We do that on seven amateur frequencies, as well, well, HF amateur frequencies, as well as six and two meters. We also provide at least eight operating positions for visiting hams to come in. Visiting hams can operate on those bands and modes granted by the license class. However, they would only use W1AW. They would not affix their calls or run with the calls or anything like that. And that rule even applies to staff. As manager and trustee, you would not see me using my personal call at W1AW. Uh And that's because we are the memorial station in honor of our founder and first president, Hiram Percy Maxim, W1AW. As many visitors come to the station, they know they have a lot of fun. They can get on the air, they generate pileups. But we also have a few other things going on at the station. Uh, One is that we are now active on six meters. We are transmitting all of our code practice and bulletins in addition to the HF on 50.350 megahertz. We started that this year. We're also gonna be operating in the winter field day for the first time and that occurs near the end of this month. Is that a club operating uh, during the winter field day? Uh, Correct, we have members from the Warren Amateur Radio Club. They're from New York that are gonna be coming on that weekend. Hopefully they'll have at least 12 operators with them and they're gonna operate on the, the uh, regular frequencies that uh, you'd normally find people operating on winter field day. And it will be just using W1EW. Excellent, thank you very much, Joe. You're most welcome, thank you very much. Energis announced a long-term wireless charging technology called Watt Up it is now the first of its kind to be certified by the FCC. Several wireless charging technologies have been developed over the years One of the more popular ones is QI, an inductive charging technology that requires the device that needs to be charged to stay in a fixed location like a charging base. You wouldn't need to plug anything into the device, but because you still need to hold it in a fixed location, the degree of additional convenience it offers isn't that significant. Another more promising technology, Resense, does magnetic resonance charging and allows a greater degree of freedom in regards to where you place your device. The devices only need to be placed in near vicinity of the charger. However, the larger distance between the charger and the device that needs to be charged, the less efficient the charging is. Plus, Resents appears to be a ladder compared to Qui, so Qui benefited from some first mover advantages, such as increased adoption. More recently, the Air Fuel Alliance was formed, which supports both Resents charging standards as well as Qui like inductive charging. The alliance was formed so it could compete more directly against the Wireless Power Consortium, the group behind the QI standard. The WPC and Air Fuel Alliance have largely the same industry players backing them, with a notable difference being that Apple joined the WPC earlier this year, while Intel joined the Air Force Alliance. What up is a wireless charging technology that can charge devices up to a distance of 15 feet. However, as we mentioned, the efficiency drops significantly with longer distance, so Energis seems to have the standardized its technology for up to 3 feet. The Watt Up technology is able to convert electricity into radio waves in the 5.8 gigahertz band, and then the receiver that comes built into the devices will be able to capture those waves and charge. Watt Up enabled devices will also be able to charge on contact Similar to the Qi-enabled device, this will provide faster and more efficient charging. Watt Up represents an incredibly positive lifestyle change, said Martin Cooper, Energist Board of Directors member and father of the cell phone, a pioneer and visionary of the wireless technology industry. This groundbreaking technology allows users to automatically charge their Watt Up-enabled devices without having to remove them from their wrist or pocket, plug them in, or place them on a mat to charge. 
freeing them from ever having to think about charging their devices. One-up transmitter technology will continue to advance in power, distance, and efficiency and scale with applications that could include integration into the bezel of computer monitors, sound bars, smart speakers, TVs, smart lighting, and other electronics in the home, office, and beyond. The theme for Hamvention 2018 is Amateur Radio Serving the Community. Ron Kramer, KD8ENJ, Hamvention General Chairman, said the theme acknowledges the role that ham radio operators play in their communities, especially in times of emergencies. Hamvention is planning to have forums on emergency communication and displays of amateur radio emergency communications vehicles. Kramer thanked the many hams who actively volunteer with community groups and thanked the public and organizers for their support of amateur radio. Hamvention 2018 will take place May 18th through 20th at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Let me just log in here to my computer. And let's see, what is, uh, what is new in the uh, tech world? The, the Spectre and Meltdown flaw, which is still an ongoing problem. It ain't over yet. In general, more patches are, I believe, still to come. Intel and AMD and uh, the ARM manufacturers, all three processors, uh, are, are vulnerable. And they've all said, we're going to do what they call microcode mitigation. That probably is what those... When you get a firmware update from your manufacturer, it's probably what's in there. Patching the processor, uh, the kind of so, but I I think that they're going to come up maybe with better uh, patches over time that don't have such a huge impact on performance. And this is the kind of the really the negative of this. You know, we've had bad security flaws before. In fact, they they continue to find flaws in Intel processors. I saw the Intel management engine, there's yet another flaw in it that somebody discovered uh, today or yesterday. So, you know, this is the way it is in the computer world. They're bugs. And adversaries, attackers, whether they're three-letter agencies uh, or just, you know, run-of-the-mill blackmailers or thieves, are very well motivated these days and uh, unfortunately very good at finding these flaws. And this particular flaw, this meltdown and specter, that's a hard one to find. It's been around for 20 years, and it took them a while to find it and exploit it. But they did. They have. No one's done it in the wild, as we say. We haven't seen any real attacks, but that doesn't mean there won't be some because it's you know so general. Everybody's got it. If you've got a modern computer, you have it. You've got the problem, and you need the fix. The initial fixes that came out very, very, very quickly, uh, I think were kind of quick, what we call in the business, quick and dirty. They they solved the problem, but they didn't solve it elegantly or well, and they perhaps had more of a performance impact than uh, people would like. And I think that over time we'll get more refined fixes. But ultimately, this is the bad news, it may require a processor redesign, and they may never get back the, the, the speed bump they got from this technique that they were using that was the, the source of the flaw. It's called speculative execution, the idea that a processor could guess ahead and uh, uh, as to what the program was about to do and prepare and start doing it ahead of time, which really speeds things up a lot. If you turn that off, you'll see a big dive in the performance of your computer. But there are ways to fix it. I, th I think there are ways to fix it that don't cause such big performance drops. And maybe we can have newly designed processors that get the benefits of speculative execution without the downsides. But that may require a new processor. Yeah, a new computer. What? Oh, that's bad news, especially for people who just bought a computer. The other bad news came out of Intel, which is that anybody who has a processor from uh, the fourth generation or earlier, that's Haswell or earlier, which is most of us, anything you bought in 2015 or earlier, anything that's less than two years old, I'm sorry, more than two years old, uh, is going to see a much bigger speed degradation than the newer processors. And so we're just going to, I just, you're just going to have to watch and see and, and cross your fingers and hope it doesn't, uh, doesn't bother you. I hate to, I hate to even mention the slowdown only because you can cause this psychological, you know, perception of a slowdown when in fact you wouldn't know to, you wouldn't think about it if you didn't know it ahead of time. 
we can, I mean, there's a lot of headroom in our processors. And it's only during certain kinds of pro, uh, activities that you see the slowdowns. So we shall, we shall see. Nevertheless, well worth uh, paying attention. As always, the advice is the same. It's not changed. When you get critical updates, apply them as quickly as you can. Although, <laughs> there's always the risk. And, and we saw that risk for some people with AMD processors or kind of poorly written antivirus programs. There's always a risk that the fix is worse than the uh, problem. Blue screens of death, things like that. Wow. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? The residents of Hawaii got emergency alerts on their phone. These are false, not true. It was an error, but it said that a ballistic missile was headed to Hawaii, and this is not a drill. Holy cow, can you imagine waking up to that? Oh, my goodness. That's terrifying. Terrifying. Well, what would you do? I mean, if, you know, I mean, I don't know what even what you would do, but where, where are you going to go? What are you going to, are you going to run away? Anyway, it was an error. We still, I don't know how that happened, but it did, it was, a, I think, a good ex, uh, ex, example, kind of a test of uh, a system now that we really, we really all have. Used to be, remember the, maybe you're not old enough to remember the fire whistles or the tsunami alerts or, you know, the, every firehouse in town used to have a big, we called it when I was a kid, the noon whistle because they'd set it off at noon every day just to test it. Big alarm, like an air raid alert alarm. And uh, I think a lot of those don't work anymore. Although, was it, weren't they all hacked? Was it Austin? <laughs> the, I think it was Austin, Texas. Somebody recently uh, hacked the uh, air raid sirens and they all went off at once. Maybe this is a hack. What it demonstrated, though, is that this new system that we really have is of, of, of text messages is probably pretty effective. It was Dallas, not Austin. Dallas. Uh, these these uh, Every phone has an emergency alert system. You've probably seen it. Uh, they have amber alerts for missing kids. They have uh, alerts for, you know, serious storm conditions. They have alerts. There's even a, a presidential alert. That's been in place for the last few years. It can be triggered by the president. And I, it, at least on most of the phones I've used, you can turn off these alerts all but the presidential alert. The highest level alert, you can't turn it off. And I would guess a ballistic missile heading toward Hawaii would count as, you know, one of those high level alerts. There was on TV screens, of course, I'm sure radio stations played that sound, you know, that awful sound you hear uh, as, t as a test once a week that alerts you to this. And, uh, but it was fake. It wasn't real. If you go on Twitter, you can see bunches of examples. What a terrifying thing to wake up to. The FCC, of course, says, uh, yeah, we're going to look into this. They take this stuff extremely seriously, as they should. Uh, who, who set that off? Was it an accident or what? 8 a.m. Hawaii Standard Time. What a terrible way to wake up. It was probably, according to local media, maybe a, a human error. Not, not something good to see. But... But if I'm going to give you a silver lining, it got people's attention. I think if you live in Hawaii, you have you pay more attention because of tsunami possibilities, right? Things like that, storms. Number one classic thing you must not do in file recovery. And it's easy to understand if I explain that when you delete a file on any operating system, it doesn't actually scrub the data away unless you do a secure deletion app. Ma Apple, for instance, on the Mac OS has an option to secure delete files. And what, what a secure deletion will do is, well, let me start with what a normal deletion will do. And in, in every case, Android, iOS, Mac OS, Windows, is it'll merely release that area of the drive and say, eh, this can be used again. It doesn't actually erase the data. The data is all still there. Secure delete will then overwrite the data. And by doing so, m make sure that no recovery tool can recover it. And therein lies a little hint about what not to do. When you're recovering hard drives using a tool like Recover, which is free, I also mentioned, uh, I told them about PC Inspector, PCinspector.de. Uh, that's made actually by a company that makes SD cards, so it's it's kind of designed for SD cards. Those tools will go out, look for files that have been released but not overwritten, and it'll say, oh yeah, there was a file here. The data is still here. In Windows... <laughs> The way they release a file, they take the file name, they take the first letter of the file name, the first byte, and they turn it into an upside down E. That's it. That's all they do. And then the file system says, oh, good, I can use this. It's the directory entries even there. It's just got an upside down E as the first letter. So the file system says, oh, I can use that. 
Uh, I'm not sure what Android does or other operating systems, but it's effectively something like that. Just a little flag. Because cause why? Because you want to make it fast. If you ever delete you know, a, a folder with a thousand files in it, it's like that, isn't it? Well, that's because it's not overwriting them. It's just turning the first letter upside down all the way through. That's fast. That's easy. It takes seconds. But that's a good thing because it means the data is still there. But the cardinal rule in file recovery is you don't recover to the drive you're recovering because then you're overwriting stuff. See, remember, the file system says, this drive's empty. I could put stuff anywhere. So you, the, if you're recovering a drive, if you've lost files or you've erased files on a drive by accident, you you if, generally the, in a forensics environment where it's critical that not, that data not be lost, let's say a bad guy has a folder inside that folder, all the banks I've robbed and he says, oh, the cops are coming and he erases. The cops get the hard drive. First thing they do is make a bite for bite exact copy of that drive. And then they put the drive aside. They don't touch it. And they work on the copy. That way there's no chance they'll accidentally overwrite the data or damage it in any way. Then they can use their file recovery tools safely on the copy. So the key when you're trying to recover something, let's say from an SD card like that, is to not write to the SD card. That's why you don't do it in the phone. You take it out, you put it in an adapter, you put it in a computer, and you and when you do the recovery, you tell, and most recovery tools are smart enough to do this, you tell the recovery tool, don't recover to the drive I'm, rec I'm recovering. Recover to my internal hard drive, please. Don't touch that drive. That drive, lock it. Don't touch it because that's where the data lies. So uh, cardinal rule number one in file recovery, do not <laughs> recover the data to the, the disk you're recovering from because then you'll overwrite other data. And that's, I think, what happened. Once that happens, there's not much you can do we talk a lot about, oh, the Department of Defense. <laughs> Actually, my favorite is the British MI5 rules for secure data deletion. They take a hard drive that's got secret stuff on it. They do secure deletion, which means they don't just erase, turn the first letter of the name upside down. They actually write ones across the whole drive, then erase it, then write zeros across the whole drive, then erase it. And they may do that 8, 9, 10, 20 times. Then... <laughs> They take the platters out of the drive, they grind them down into dust, they put them in a vault in the basement of the MI5 building, and they leave them there. That's that's secure. That's pretty secure. But I think, and I've looked at lots of people, who, I, once you overwrite data, you really can't get it back. You'd need some pretty sp specialized gear that was very sensitive that would be able to say, well, those are zeros. But there's a faint electronic, because it's magnetic, right? There's a faint little trace of magnetism that looks like it's a, oh, that must be the original. No one's ever seen this. <laughs> and many security experts have tried to duplicate that. And I don't think anybody's ever succeeded. Rule, another rule. Here's a cardinal rule number two. Back up your data. And the easiest way on a smartphone, the automatic way. Put a program on your computer that does that, uh, on your phone that does that. I use Google's Photos. That's free. It'll back up unlimited video and pictures automatically, instantly to the Google Cloud where they're stored safely. Amazon, if you're a Prime member, they have a same program. Uh, Microsoft's OneDrive will do that. Dropbox will do that. If you want a belt and suspenders, have Dropbox and Google. Because you lose, phones get lost, SD cards stop working. It's not unusual. It can happen. Be very careful when you're doing data recovery. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Are you ready for another excursion into amateur radio history? This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another installment of the ancient amateur archives. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. There was a point in time when many hams wanted FM satellites. Maybe that is still true today. We now have an overabundance of FM satellites. There's SO50, AO85, IO86, AO91, and Lilac Sat 2. AO92 and PicSat are going through commissioning right now and will be available soon. The Lilac Sat 2 transponder is sporadic, and IO86 is in an equatorial orbit with activation by schedule. The satellites that will be most used are SO50, AO85, AO91, and after commissioning, AO92 and PicSat. Then, September 1st, AMSAT will have Fox 1C launching. This will put yet another FM satellite in orbit. 
the Chinese will have an FM satellite launching as we go to press with this story. It is called Chao In Lai, named after the former premier of the People's Republic of China from 1949 until 1976. As I mentioned at the beginning, if FM is your thing, there are plenty of satellites to choose. Most can be worked with an HT and a handheld beam. The command stations just tested AO-92 with an HT and rubber duck inside a house. There was no competition for capturing the satellite as they were the only two stations using it. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1918. Major Armstrong develops the superheterodyne receiver while serving in France. CW is used by the military during the war. 1919. Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels tries to get the Navy a total monopoly on all wireless communications. The ARRL's blue card appeal saves the concept of private radio operations. Amateurs get back on the air in November 1919. 1919, Woodrow Wilson becomes the first president to speak over radio when he broadcasts a speech to the American troops in Europe. 1919 and 1920, King Sparks' last stand. With the success of CW in the war and the availability of tubes, Spark was doomed. Some amateurs experiment with broadcasting, including station 8XK, later KDKA. The number of hams, 5,719. 1920. Amateur police radio becomes popular. Amateurs operated as an inter-system police communication service to relay broadcasts of crimes and stolen vehicles. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the ARRL Propagation Forecast for Friday, January the 19th. A single tiny sunspot is all we have to look at today. It's yet another one of those weak sunspots that appear and then disappear with no impact on propagation. On the other hand, there is a hole in the sun's atmosphere and it's facing our way and spewing out a stream of solar particles. You can expect this blast of solar wind to arrive this weekend and cause some disruption to the higher HF bands. On VHF and UHF, most of the action appears to be taking place in the upper Midwest, with some band openings also occurring in West Texas. Foundations of Amateur Radio A week or so ago, I watched a movie that was simultaneously the funniest and saddest movie I'd seen in a while, Pecking Order. It follows the members of the Christchurch Poultry, Bantam and Pigeon Club in the lead up to the New Zealand National Championships as they battle history and each other in a quest for glory and for the love of their birds. Think best in show with chickens. While watching, all I could see was squabbling radio amateurs. We're having a similar situation in the Wireless Institute of Australia. There is evidence of gross financial mismanagement, claims and counterclaims, directors with an axe to grind, lawsuits and feathers in the mail. I understand that the Radio Society of Great Britain went through similar disruption several years ago. The ARRL is also going through upheaval right now. Rules, conduct unbecoming, expulsions and gag orders abound. All these experiences deal with how a board conducts itself, how individual members react and how the main membership just wants to get on with things. Today I read an article in CQ magazine titled we have met the enemy, and he is us. It leads me to wonder, what is it about being on a board that causes you to become entitled? What is it about being a radio amateur that makes you feel entitled to belittle and ignore those around you? What is it about our community that is toxic and detrimental to its survival? No doubt, as I become older and perhaps wiser, I'll get personal insight into these attributes when some young Turk comes along and puts me firmly in my place. But for now, I'm the young Turk, and you can keep your quintoquagenarian jokes to yourself. I've heard it said that if an organisation is eating itself, let it die. There is something to be said for that sentiment. It causes new structures to be formed, new processes to be created, new ideas to propagate, 
and new people to participate. The thing is, doing this also kills off history. It kills off a knowledge base. It destroys lives. It makes for loss of productivity, loss of investment, and it is just plain bad for business. When I was growing up, I was told of an organization that would split its territory in half and form two new organizations once it hit 20 or so employees. Each new organization would carry on, splitting in half as it grew. The idea was that if you had more people than that inside a company, it became unwieldy. I don't know what's become of that organization, what it's called, or even if it still exists. I'm using it as an example of new thinking a new way of trying to build an organization, a new approach. What kinds of new approaches could we come up with for our representative bodies in amateur radio? For that matter, what new approaches could we imagine for ourselves and our community? There's a very powerful quote by Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed, organized citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The DP0 GVN WSPR is now in operation from the German Neumeyer Tree Institute Research Station of the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar and Marine Research. The installation is part of a scientific project of the Technical University of Munich in cooperation with the University of Bremen and the German Amateur Radio Club. The beacon is still under test and will be shut down occasionally for more configuration and optimization of antennas and software before it can be mounted at its final installation site in a few weeks, said Rainier Englert, DF2NU. The technology consists of a multiband WSPR receiver that can simultaneously monitor up to eight bands in the 160 to 6 meters and feed several hundred receive reports per hour to the WhisperNet. The 5-watt multiband transmitter has also been commissioned and is working into a vertical antenna. After a few days in service, the DP0GVN has received several thousand beacon spots already. In related news, DP0GVN will be the call sign for Matthias Mosch, DH5CW, starting in February at Neumeyer 3 Research Station for one year, and he plans to be active on HF. The past year, he's been using DH5CW from the German Antarctic base, QSL DP0 GVN via DL5 EBE. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Rain's founder, producer, Hap Holly, KC9RP, considers this week's Rain rerun from 1990 a real gem. It's one of those very rare talks Hap recorded on site at a radio club. Here's part one of My Early Days as a Ham by former Chicago and current L.A. broadcaster Dick Helton, W9CTY. The speaker that we have this evening is Dick Helton. Afternoon news anchor for WBBM News Radio 78 has been fascinated by radio since childhood and broke into broadcasting in the 60s while studying journalism at the University of Illinois. These days at WBBM News Radio, Helson is known as a versatile professional journalist with an adversity to controversy. His weekday interviews explore subjects ranging from politics to entertainment, and he regularly hosts three of the station's most provocative call-in programs, Ask the Governor, Ask the Mayor, and Talk to the Schools. There's much more here. It tells you all about all his amateur radio, but I'm not going to let you. He sit there, fall asleep on me, and be asleep when he comes up to talk. Mr. Hilton. Thank you. I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to come here and to meet with all of you tonight. And when Dave Alpert um, called me a um, few, well, in fact, now several weeks ago, asking if I would come and talk to you all tonight. I said, gee, that's terrific. I'd be very happy to do so if it would work into the schedule. And as it turns out, it did. Uh, it's rare, being someone on the radio such as myself, that I, I get an opportunity to actually see the audience. So it's kind of nice for me to be able to do that. When I walked in tonight, Mike Wolf over here, who is apparently uh, quite a listener of WBBM, walked up and he said, gee, you don't look a thing like you sound. <laughs> and, and of course I said I never did but it, it, it reminds me a little bit of the fact that those of us who are in radio whether it's in ham radio or if we're in professional radio or whatever 
Uh, to some extent, we aren't maybe who other people think we are. It's one of the great joys of ham radio, I think, is the fact that you can really sort of be anonymous to that other person. You can open up your personality. Uh, you can enjoy who you are. You can enjoy the other people that you're talking with. And yet there's a little shield. Now, the real truth of the matter, of course, comes out when you have meetings like this and when you become involved in clubs. And then you get the opportunity to see this person that you maybe have talked with for quite a period of time. And that person doesn't look anything like you expected. But that's the joy of it. Because you know that person. You know that personality. And you know perhaps a great deal more about that individual than, uh, than you might have known had you met on a face-on-face -face basis to begin with. I, I told Dave that I would talk a little bit about ham radio and professional broadcasting and how this all sort of came together for me. And to some extent, my career in broadcasting is a little bit like the old uh, uh, Ted Baxter role on the old Mary Tyler Moore show. It all started at a little 250-watt radio station. Uh, in my case, it, it really began in the basement of our family home down in a little town called Brockton, Illinois, which is about 200 miles south of here, population 300. I uh, graduated in a high school class that had 16 kids in it, as a matter of fact. Uh, but my dad uh, had a great joy for listening to shortwave. And when I was a little kid, about six years of old, six years of age, I'd go down into the basement of our home, and he had a Hallicrafters S40B. Now, some of you here will remember an S40B. In fact, some of you here will remember the name Hallicrafters. Uh, <laughs> be that as it may, that, that little radio opened up for me a wonderful world of of things that went far beyond my little town of Brockton. I could listen to the radio shows that were available through the, the networks and uh, the various broadcasts that came out of Chicago and New York and, and other places. But also, I had a chance to listen to people who were in faraway places. And for a kid that was basically a farm kid in a small town in East Central Illinois, that to me was fascinating. And it made me want to know more about who these people were and we'd tune in to the hams, and we'd listen to them. Of course, it was all AM back then. But we'd listen to these conversations going on between people in New York and Los Angeles, or, or somebody maybe uh, in, in, uh, in New York talking to someone in Europe someplace. And I thought, what a terrific thing this is. I mean, here you have this opportunity to talk to somebody far away and, and to get to know that person on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Well, as it turns out, over a long period of time, I became involved with other things, and my dad had the farming operation going. And uh, when you're farmers, you don't have a lot of time maybe to devote your attention to some of the other things that you would like. But when I was a sophomore in high school, my dad, who had always wanted to get that ham license for himself but had never found the time to do it, uh, came up to me and he said, Dick, I'll, I'll make you a proposition. He said, if you study for and you get a ham license, he says, I'll help you build a pretty good ham radio station. Well, I said, okay. I mean, after all, when you're a kid on a farm and the next house is a mile away and it's the dead of winter, you don't have a whole lot to occupy your time. So I checked around a little bit and I found a fellow in a town about 15 miles from me who was a ham. His name was Dick England. His call was K9HQF. And I called him up one night and I introduced myself and I said, I want to become a ham radio operator. Dick said, hey, come on down. I'll teach you everything you need to know. Now, I should tell you a little bit about Dick. Dick was the janitor at the high school in this other little town. He was in his 30s. He was raising a couple of kids on his own. Probably had more things going on in his life just to try to make ends meet on a day-to-day -day basis than, than most people that I knew. And yet there was no hesitation whatsoever. He said, come on, I'll teach you. And so in the winter, of 1960 into 1961, I spent a lot of time at Dick's house. I'd drive down a couple of nights a week to his home in the winter, slippery roads, ice, snow. My mother wondered if this, in fact, was all worthwhile for her kid to be out there on the highways uh, having his life threatened uh, with the, the bad weather. But I assured her that it was. Dick was the kind of guy that when I walked into his home and I met him, I knew that this was the hobby for me. I wanted to be like him. 
I wanted to have the kind of, of warmth that he had to bring me into that fold. I have to tell you a little bit about his radio station. Dick always said he was broadcasting from the th throne room. In fact, he was. <laughs> Dick's station was in the second floor bathroom of his house. And I learned the code and the theory sitting on the only other available seat in that room. <laughs> I may be unique in all the world of having learned the code and, and the theory sitting on the john, but I did. Finally, it came to that point where he said, I think you're ready. So he called another fellow in another town and said, I've got a kid over here, he's in high school, and I've been teaching him the code and the theory, and I think he's ready. And I want you to give him the exam. Now back then, as far away as I live from Chicago, I qualified for what was then the conditional exam. Voluntary exams then were the exception, frankly, not the rule. But we went over to this guy's house one night, and there I sat. I mean, this was the moment of truth. And we've all been confronted with that. Your mind turns to mush. Your hand is just about as effective as mush on the key. And you think, what am I doing here? But for some strange, unbelievable reason, I passed this test. And about six weeks later came that little envelope, the little glass window from the FCC. And there I was, W9CTY, conditional license. Never forget it. 16th day of June, 1961. Now, in the middle of June, on a farm, there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, you're out getting weeds out of the beans and trying to do the corn and whatever. My dad said, we've got to go to Indianapolis. We've got to buy some radios. Because he was just as thrilled over this as I was. And so we dropped everything we were doing, and we hopped in the car, took the hired man with us, and drove to Indianapolis about 100 miles away, and we came home with an HT-37, a Drake 2B receiver, a bunch of copper weld wire, sack full of insulators, a JT-30 mic, and Dick came up and we began to assemble a ham radio station in my bedroom. And we worked on that for a couple of days, didn't manage to burn anything up, popped a couple of fuses, and we got on the air. And I can tell you, as everybody in this room who's a ham radio operator, the thrill of the first contact from my radio station in my bedroom going out to somebody else was unbelievable. The man's name was Shorty, his call was W9IBI. He lived in Mattoon, Illinois, just about 30 miles away. <laughs> but it could have been Siberia, for all I knew, because it was the most dramatic, wonderful thing that I could imagine. And of course, as you can imagine, the rest of that summer was, I mean, ham radio around the clock. And, you know, finally got to the point where I, I can remember my parents beating on the, on the, on the, the wall between my bedroom and theirs at about two o'clock in the morning, saying, sh "My dad used to say, shut that, not darn thing off." But he finally got to the point where he grew a little bit tired of ham radio himself. But it was terrific, and it was a proud moment for me. But a prouder moment came for me a few years later when I was in college at the University of Illinois in Champaign, and our home was about 40 miles from Champaign, and I had all this ham radio gear sitting in my bedroom down on the farm, nobody using it. So I called my dad one day from my dorm room and I said, Dad, I said, here's what we're going to do. I'll give up my college weekends and I'll come home. I'm going to teach you the theory and the code. I want you to get a license. Well, at that time, my dad was about um, 44 years old. I mean, then it seemed old. Today, it's nothing. <laughs> but I said, I'll do this. And he said, let's try it. And so I, I drove home every weekend and I taught him theory and I taught him code. And within six months, he had his license. After all those years of having wanted to do that, he had his license. And boy, you talk about starting to build a radio station, we did then. <laughs> because we had a lot of room. And we had a lot of places for wire and towers and things like that. And by the time we got all done with it, and some of you who are older in this group will recall some of this gear, uh, we finally had a complete Collins station, including a KWM2A and a 51S1. A 30S1 amplifier, and we also had a Telrex Christmas tree for 2015 and 10 on top of a 200 foot tower. I mean, we played radio in a big way. Now, for me, this was, you know, this was the avenue to DX contests. So I became a, just a, a, an inveterate DXer. You know, on two, three o'clock in the morning, boy, I was out there. My dad enjoyed rag chewing, and he 
just developed a terrific amount of number of friends all over the United States and people that he'd go and visit with and people who'd come and see us. And I've got a few awards sitting on my walls at home now from some DX contests from CQ and the ARRL, things that I'm very proud of. But the most proud thing, of course, is the, is the ham radio license of my dad. My dad only lived seven years after he got his license. He died very young at the age of 51. But those, I think, were seven of the most wonderful years of his life. And, and it meant a great deal to me to be able to provide that for him. I should tell you, and as you all know, ham radio is a pretty good way to get in trouble, especially for a kid. When I was a senior in high school, a couple of my good buddies were hams that lived in a little town about another 10 miles from us. And one of the fellows, whose name was Ron, his dad ran the local funeral home. And they lived in the house next door. And Ron and another pal, Gene, and I would spend weekends. And, you know, we were really the nerds and the geeks of our community. <laughs> I mean, you know, we were the guys that played with the radios and strung wire, you know, and could draw diagrams and circuits and things like that. And everybody else is playing basketball, you know, and, uh, and doing all sorts, all manner of uh, evil things on weekends. At least our mothers told us that's what they were doing. But Ron and Gene and I, we were pretty good at radio. And so I'll never forget, it was on a, it was a Sunday afternoon in the middle of summer. And we were working on Ron's rig, and it was an AM rig, and we're trying to get just a little more out of those finals, just tweak it just a little bit more. And we were getting some pretty good results. Well, unbeknownst to us, there was a funeral going on next door. And as I'm told, I was later told, the preacher had about 100 people in the room and he was saying something like, you know, I'm sure if Harold could be here with us today, he'd be saying to us, hello, hello, test. Hello, 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 test. Hello, CQ, 75, hello. Apparently the funeral home PA was a damn good receiver. And uh, needless to say, we never played ham radio on uh, funeral days uh, anymore after that. We did take the, um, after I got married and came to Chicago, actually I got married after I came to Chicago and started working for WBBM Radio. I married a um, beautiful young woman who uh, was a flight attendant for American Airlines. As a matter of fact, this year we'll celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary. She was pretty excited about ham radio too. I mean, she enjoyed this hobby. And I thought she was so excited about it that I had no compunction on our honeymoon of taking the KWM2 along with us. <laughs> Principally because we were going to the South Pacific. We honeymooned in Australia and New Zealand and wound up in Tahiti. Uh, and I got licenses in all three places to, uh, to operate from. And uh, Janice in later years has, uh, has often uh, told some of her friends that on her honeymoon she spent more time saying da 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 instead of ooh ah ooh ah. But uh, that's not true. Uh, although I must tell you that DXing from Tahiti is, uh, is, is quite a lot of fun. Later adventures took us to India. Uh, where we tried to get the KWM-2 through customs at the New Delhi airport uh, about a week and a half before India went to war with Pakistan. You can imagine the customs inspector's eyes when he opened up that suitcase and there was this big radio inside with all sorts of wires and cables and things like that. And I knew we were in trouble when he said, well, <clears throat> let me get my supervisor. And the supervisor came over and he said, let me get somebody from the army. And we spent three days going through the Indian bureaucracy trying to get the KWM-2 out of quarantine so that we could actually use it, which we later did. And then took it on to Nepal, uh, up in the Himalayas, to Kathmandu, uh, where uh, I have the pleasure of having amateur radio license number four. Uh, this beautifully typed out ham radio license that I have the call sign 9NCTY. Now, for those of you who are DXers, you know that the, the real prefix is 9N1. Uh, I'm sure many of you know 9N1MM, uh, Father Moran over there, who's a terrific fellow, and I'll tell you more about him later. But anyway, I could not convince this man at the Telecommunications Bureau who was typing out this license that it was 9N1CTY. No, 9NCTY, because apparently that's the way it looked on the back of airplanes. So that's what I wound up with. <clears throat> and I spent more time explaining the call sign to people that I was talking to than, uh, than actually making contacts, but it was a lot of fun. Let me tell you a little bit about Father Moran, because as I saw a lot of nods in here and smiles when I mentioned his name. This is a terrific fellow. Perhaps some of you have had a chance to meet him on a one-on-one -on -one basis, because he spent some time back here in Chicago. That's where his family is. Janice and I had gone there the first time, and we were staying in this hotel called the Hotel Annapurna. And he came over to meet us for the first time, drove his little VW bug over, and he came into our room, and he looked at the two of us, and he realized, I mean, we didn't have to say anything. He realized we hadn't really been eating real well. I mean, you can only take so much curry. 
over a period of, of a few days. And he said, you people need some food. And I said, I think you're right. And within a moment, we were in his Volkswagen, going through a gate, knocking on a door at the American ambassador's residence. And she opened up the door and she said, Father Moran, come in with your friends. And within a matter of minutes, we were eating Vermont ham and Wisconsin cheese and California wine and just having a terrific time. And this is the kind of man this is. So if you have a chance to talk with him and you hear his call on the air, take that opportunity to speak with him. We spent other times in, uh, in Ecuador and in Thailand and Hong Kong and, and, and many, many other places. And I can assure you that, that doing that and meeting ham radio operators from around the world uh, on that one-on-one -on -one basis is, is just a terrific opportunity. It's, it's really something that, uh, that brings the spirit of what this hobby is home to you. At, at WBBM, having been a ham radio operator has been very useful to me because, first of all, it has made me a friend with the technicians. And if you're a pal with the techs, you're in. You want to be their friend because if you're not their friend, they can make life miserable for you. Not that anybody at WBBM would ever do that, but the point is that it's good to be their friend. And, and I know enough technically that I occasionally help them with the gear and stuff like that or make suggestions about perhaps things we can do to improve. Uh, I did floor one technician one time one evening when I was on the air, and he was on the other side of the window running the uh, pots and, and the knobs and the dials and making sure that the transmitter was up and running okay. And it was 10.30, and it was time to do the station ID, and I said, you're listening to CBS in Chicago, W9CTY. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked up, and he wasn't there anymore. <laughs> he, was, he was on the floor. <laughs> but I did get some QSL cards. <laughs> So for, for a time, I, I think I was perhaps the most powerful ham radio station in the world. I, I haven't done that since. I have, on the other hand, uh, had occasions where I've been on, on the ham radio talking with people and have them recognize me. Uh, the occasion occurred when I was talking to a fellow in San Francisco, and he said, boy, your voice sounds familiar. And he finally put one and one together and, and came up with who I was. And as it turns out, this fellow was a pilot for United Airlines and flew into Chicago and United occasionally when they fly into the city on one of their uh, audio channels puts up our radio station so people can listen to the news and so he had heard me in that case and on another occasion I was talking to a fellow out in the state of Kansas who was a Kansas State trooper and said that uh, he recognized my voice and said that he this was back when I was working at night and he used to listen to our station as he was making his patrols up and down the state of Kansas uh, late at night so that has been part of the added enjoyment as well and you know, in, in one way or another, we all owe our involvement in this hobby really to somebody else. Somebody who was either willing to kind of take us under our wing and to teach us the code and to teach us the theory. Maybe it's somebody you called up on the phone or perhaps it was that, that strange person next door that had these weird antennas in the backyard and who everybody else suspected as being something more or perhaps less uh, than what they really were. And, and now we all know what it's like to be like that, uh, and who maybe made funny little squiggly lines on your TV set from time to time. But the point was, and is, and does remain, that there are people who want to help. Uh, in my case, uh, the person that really wanted to help was my dad, uh, who had that mysterious little radio down in his basement, and had those strange little meters, little green meters, and little green windows with funny numbers that I didn't really fully comprehend or understand. But I'll tell you what they are. Those are windows that enrich our lives. Thank you. This has been a talk by Dick Helton, W9CTY, afternoon anchor on Chicago's WBBM News Radio 78. This presentation about his earlier days in ham radio was given before the North Shore Radio Club, Highland Park, Illinois. I'm Hap Holly, KC on RP in Chicago. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Uncharacteristically cold weather in East Central Florida in early January prompted members of the North Brevard Amateur Radio Club, K4NBR, to assist the area's homeless. The new year began with a bitter cold front descending upon Central Florida, bringing temperatures that hovered around freezing. Such conditions can be especially concerning for those lacking regular shelter from the elements. NBARC members Rick DeLuco, K4JTT, Robert Ortiz, KJ4VEH, William Klozowski, 
K4SVT, and Michael Ellickson, KE4MWZ, set out in their own vehicles, searching the city of Titusville for homeless residents. For the next two evenings and using amateur radio as communications, the group worked out in the cold, wet weather for more than 12 hours, logging some 120 miles on the roads around Titusville. The Disabled American Veterans Center in Titusville had opened its doors as a cold weather shelter and offered a warm place to sleep and eat. The ham radio group alerted local law enforcement so they were aware of the effort and in the hope of that on-duty officers also might reach out. The group was able to locate five homeless individuals on its first evening tour of the town and provide them with transportation out of the cold. Local police also contacted the team to help and to provide transportation for other homeless individuals located by on-duty officers. One additional homeless person located late on the first night had a need for immediate medical attention and was transported to a local hospital. Within the ARRL Southern Florida section, Enbark is an ARRL affiliated community service organization and is involved in several area events. It also provides backup communication for Parish Hospital as needed. Hardware for a permanent whisper beacon system in the Antarctic is currently on its way. The installation, a joint project of the Technical University of Munich, the University of Bremen, and the Deutsche Amateur Radio Club, consists of 5-watt beacon transmitters for 160 through 6 meters and a multi-band whisper receiver that will simultaneously monitor all bands from 160 to 15 meters and post up to 700 reports per hour to WhisperNet. Commissioning of the system at the German Neumayer 3 research station is planned for mid-January. In related news, DP0GVN will be the call sign for Matthias Mosch, DH5CW, who will be active at the Neumeyer 3 research station for one year, and he plans to be active on HF. For the past year, he has been using DH5CW from the German Antarctic base. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station has announced the addition of two more educational organizations to Phase 2 list to host an Aries ham radio contact with an ISS crew member. The selected schools submitted proposals before the deadline last November and joined the 13 schools and groups announced in mid-December. The two extra scheduling opportunities are special events thanks to Aries' two major sponsors, the NASA Space Communications and Navigation Group and the Center for Advancement of Science in Space. Students of the two organizations will travel to aerospace conferences where the Aries radio contacts will be featured. Chosen were Quest for Space, Quest Institute for Quality Education, San Jose, California, whose Aries contact will be a highlight of the July 23 through 26 ISS R&D conference in San Francisco, and Burns Science and Technical Charter School in Oak Hill, Florida, whose Aris contact will be featured at the July 11th through 13th space conference at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Aries anticipates that NASA will be able to provide scheduling opportunities from July to December of next year. These schools and organizations now must submit amateur radio equipment plans to host a scheduled contact with a member of the ISS crew, as well as an equipment plan that demonstrates their ability to execute a ham radio contact with the ISS. Once the ARIS technical team approves their equipment plans, the remaining finalists will be scheduled as their availability and flexibility match up with the scheduling opportunities. ARIS' primary goal is to engage young people in science, technology, engineering, and math activities and involve them in activities related to space exploration, amateur radio, communications, and areas of associated study and career possibilities. ARIS is a cooperative venture of the International Amateur Radio Societies and the space agencies that support the International Space Station. In the United States, sponsors are the ARRL, AMSAT, the Center for Advancement of Science and Space, and NASA. And finally this week, a story that hits a little close to home for me is it's one of the things that got me interested in radio. The creator of one of the most popular TV shows about radio, WKRP in Cincinnati, Hugh Wilson, passed away on Sunday, January 14th, at his home in Charlottesville, Virginia. His wife, Charter Smith Wilson, told the Associated Press on Wednesday that he had been battling lung cancer and emphysema. He was 74. Wilson was executive producer for all 90 episodes of WKRP, including the legendary Thanksgiving stunt gone wrong, Turkeys Away, which TV Guide ranked among its 100 greatest television episodes of all time. In a 2015 interview with the Archive of American Television, which you can access on YouTube, Wilson recounted how the ridiculously funny turkey episode was based on a true story. He said that Jerry Bloom, who was the general manager of WQXI, in which, on which WKRP was based, told him that he had been fired from a Texas radio station for throwing turkeys out of a helicopter. 
He turned to Jerry and said, you just won me an Emmy. But Wilson didn't win an Emmy for WKRP. His Emmy came in 1988 for writing the Bridge episode of the CBS series Frank's Place, which he created for WKRP alum Tim Reed. WKRP in Cincinnati, a sitcom about a fictional radio station in Cincinnati, ran for four seasons on CBS from 1978 to 1982. It featured Howard Hessman as Dr. Johnny Fever, whose character Wilson said was based off of Skinny Bobby, a disc jockey he worked with in Atlanta. Tim Reed starred as Venus Flytrap. Gordon Jump played the bungling general manager. Gary Sandy portrayed program director Andy Travis, and Lonnie Anderson was cast as the bombshell receptionist. WKRP did not use sound-alike music on the program. They used needle drop rights for the real thing, like Pink Floyd, for example. Wilson was an Emmy winner and seven-time nominee. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like the Benton County Radio Operators Club repeater system on 145.290 MHz and 443.025 MHz in Northwest Arkansas following the Thursday evening BCRO repeater system 7 p.m. net. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, amateur radio newsletters from around the world, sources on the internet, and the packet bulletin board systems of the United States and Canada. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.